Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our regular weekly message. And today we're continuing our series, The Hope of Christmas. And this is our second message in our series. And today's message is entitled, The Dragon Who Tried to Steal Christmas. Yes, my friend, there is a dragon that is bent on trying to steal our Christmas hope the hope of Christmas from each and every one of us. But we have one who is standing by, ready, willing, and able to defend us from all foes, from all fears, from all temptations, and from all dangers. His name, or he is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Great I Am. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So with, will you turn with me please to Matthew chapter 2 verse 13 through 18. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel reaping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Matthew tells a horrifying story, a horrifying tale that is in many ways connected to the Christmas story, but is never really told in the Christmas story. That is the story of the dragon who tried to steal Christmas. Today, I want to tell you about the monster who sided with the dragon to steal our Christmas hope. Christmas is always presented to us with joy and peace and hope, as it should be. But there's a darker side of Christmas. It's a darker side to that Christmas story. And that side is not always told. You see, there were wise men living in the East who were watching and waiting for the hope of Christmas, which was the birth of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, the King of the Jews. This is the record of their visit to Jerusalem, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. As I said, these wise men, also known as the Magi, were watching and waiting for the promised Messiah, the king of the Jews, which would be the hope of Christmas for the whole world. They were probably scanning the night skies for generations and generations, maybe for centuries and centuries, waiting and hoping that it would be them who discovered the sign of the birth of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, the one who will save the whole world from their sins. As soon as these men saw his star rising on, the western, on that western horizon, with joyful heart, they packed their bags 
and they packed their belongings and they prepared for travel. They set out to find this promised Messiah that they had been patiently waiting for. As the Christmas yard sign says, wise men still seek him. So these wise men went out on a seek and find mission to seek the hope of Christmas and to find the fulfillment thereof, which is Jesus, Jesus the Christ. We don't know how long the trip was. We don't know how long it took them to travel from the east all the way down to Bethlehem. But what we do know is that they did not come and find baby Jesus lying in a manger because there was no room for him in the end. By then, Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus was living in a house somewhere in Bethlehem. I want, you, want us to turn to that account. Matthew chapter 2, verse 11 through 9. When they heard the king, they departed. This is speaking about the wise men, the, the, the Magi. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The scripture does not depict Jesus as a little tiny helpless baby, but as a young child. And it states that these wise men, when these wise men got there, Jesus was living in a house with his mother Mary. They were no longer in the manger. So after worshiping Jesus, these wise men offered him gifts. Then Jesus or God warns them in a dream not to return to King Herod because he wanted to steal Christmas by killing baby Jesus. Look at this deceptive, uh, uh, the deceptiveness of King Herod. Look with me. Matthew chapter 2, verse 7 through 8. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Deception, deception, lies and more lies, lies and deception. That is the same thing that we go through today. We suffer the same. God said that in the last days, he said delusion so strong that it will even deceive the elect if it was possible. And Believe me, that delusion has come upon the whole world because the whole world is deluded and they've gone astray. You know, they tell us lies and they try to deceive us. And they do. They deceive the masses with lies upon lies. People in power will lie and steal and deceive to hold on to power and hold on to wealth. And it is no different now as it was back then. There was no difference. Herod claimed that he wanted to go and worship the infant king of the Jews as well. So that he wanted to worship him with the Magi. But it was a lie. He secretly, he wanted to murder him to remove the threat. And Jesus is still a threat to people today. He's still a threat to those in power. They still want him dead. They still try to kill even the memory of him. They still say that they will not have this Messiah rule over them. They still refuse to make room in their hearts for him. Their no vacancy sign still blinks a blatant sign, bright, bright words. There is no room in this end, they have said in their hearts, 
There is no God but themselves. And they refuse to come. They refuse to worship. They refuse to bow down before the King of Kings and the Lords of Lords. They refuse to trust and hope. They refuse to obey the only one that can save them. They refuse to give allegiance to the one whom they will have to give an account to. Because the book of Hebrews tells us, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. There is no place that we can run. There is no place that we can hide that God does not know and where God does not see. Everything is open and laid bare before him. He sees all and he knows all. Revelation chapter 12 tells us a story about a dragon whose tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. This is a dragon who tried to steal Christmas. Every opportunity Satan gets, he will try to steal Christmas right out of our hearts. But we must be like the wise men who traveled afar. They travel a far, far distance to seek him who is born king of the Jews. If you want to, to, to know more about that war, check out our video, Revelation 12 War. Why did Satan attack under our too deep category? You see, God had a plan, but if you notice, the devil had a counter plan that could not and did not thwart or frustrate the plan of God. God's plan was for Jesus to be born the king of the Jews, to be born in Bethlehem, to be born to a virgin named Mary, to grow up and usher in the kingdom of God, to give sight to the blind, to heal the sick, and to make the lame walk, to cure the leper, and most of all, to purchase salvation for all mankind. God's plan is to bless and not to curse. God's plan is to send us blessings and not to cause us harm. God's plan is to give us hope and a future. There's nothing that our God will not do for us. There is nothing that our God will withhold from us because we are his beloved. The wise men were diligently seeking a sign from the birth of the Jewish Messiah. But when they saw it, they packed up and traveled a long, long distance to where he was. They left their home to go and seek this newborn king. He was, wherever he was, they didn't know for sure. They followed his star. We have a star. It's called the scriptures. We need to read those scriptures. We need to follow those scriptures because we need to find that Messiah. He is our only Christmas hope. He is the only hope for us to have life. So bearing gifts, these wise men, this Magi came, presented them the, these gifts to Jesus. They fell down before him and they worshipped him even though he was only a young child. He's now the risen Messiah the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Great I Am. Will we not fall down in the same way and prostrate ourselves before Him and worship Him for the joy of Christmas hope? Look at Esther chapter 1, verse 13. It says, Then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure towards all who were versed in law and judgment. See, we have a king. His name is God. And God is still calling. He's still speaking to wise men today. 
those who will diligently seek him, who are, who are searching his law, who is versed in his laws and his precepts. Those who seek him will find him. Those who study to show themselves approved, like workmen, need not to be ashamed. Because when we study God's word, he will reveal himself. He will reveal things to us. He will help us to understand the times that we live in, as the above verse suggested. You know, there's a mythical legend originating in Europe. And it's most probably Germany that talks about a demon of Christmas. He's huge in stature, covered in fur, and has vicious sharp fangs and vicious teeth and razor sharp claws. He has horns and cloven hoofs for feet. He's mostly depicted as a half man and half goat. His face is a distortion of terror, wears chains and bells, and is said to come out on the 5th of December, which is known as Krampusnacht. When translated, it means Krampus night. That was this past Monday. He carries a sack and birch sticks with which to beat the naughty children with. And some, he says, they, they say he beats them and puts them in the sack that's on his back and takes them back to his lair where he either eats them or tortures them or throws them in the fire. His name is Krampus, which comes from the word Krampen, which is German for claw. We posted a video last Monday. It's called, it's Krampus Real, and it's found in our too deep section. I would encourage you to check that out. So, children, you better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. Maybe Krampus is coming to town. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But there is a dragon who is trying to steal Christmas. And his name is Satan or the devil. Just like he tried to steal that very first Christmas by killing baby Jesus through King Herod when he gave the order to kill every young boy two years old or younger in the vicinity, in the vicinity of Bethlehem. Even now, he's still trying to steal Christmas today. They, they tell us that it's politically incorrect to say Merry Christmas. But how can we not say Merry Christmas when we're celebrating hope? Christmas is hope. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry, Merry Christmas. May the Lord bless you. You see, there's an old story that is always new whenever we tell it. The story of that first Christmas when Christ was born. It's like that Christmas card. It's like Christmas cards that we sent out. The prophets of old heralded his coming in words of warnings and in letters of promises. And even now, it's still fresh and new, even though the story is thousands of years old. It's like the story I read some, some time ago. Old Mr. and Mrs. Cooper invited the writer to their home for Christmas dinner at Winona Lake, Indiana. Underneath their Christmas tree, it prominently displayed was a red cardboard with some clippings of three wise men and Merry Christmas pasted on it. I was told that the worn cardboard was 45 years old and had been placed under the tree every Christmas. The story? The Cooper's only son had made the Christmas card in school for his daddy. And on his way home, some bad boys were going to tear it up. Although not used to fighting, the little boy took off his coat and fought them off for the gift to his dad. The Coopers never knew 
until a neighbor who saw it happen told them. And so, in deep appreciation, as only parents can know, that worn out card with scotch tape on various places had been set in front of all other presents for nearly half a century underneath their Christmas tree. You know, the old redemption story is like that red cardboard Christmas card. It may be old, it may be tattered, it may look worn out and frayed on the sides, an archaic relic that has seen its better days. It's meaningless and worthless to those who cannot see and to those who do not value it. But to us, to whom it is given and who have accepted it, it is the most precious of all the Christmas gifts because it is the Christmas hope. Praise the Lord, the dragon who tried to steal Christmas did not succeed. The Lord Jesus overcame sin, he overcame de temptations, and he overcame death. You see, the devil tried to trip him up. The devil tried to steal Christmas, but Jesus would not and did not let him steal the Christmas from us. We still have a Christmas hope because on the third day, even though Jesus died on the third day, he rose again to life and now he's seated at the right hand of power. And one day he's coming back to get us. One day he's going to split those skies and he's going to say, come home. Well done, my good and faithful servants. But to those who reject him, to those who say there is no room in this end for you, Jesus. He will say, depart from me. I never knew you. And just like Krampus, who takes those children and puts them in a the fire, they will depart to everlasting punishment, which is the lake of fire. Its flames are never quenched. Its heat is never not. It always burns. And there's always torment. This is what awaits those who refuse to accept Jesus. Why? Because he, the King of Kings, the King of the Jews, and the Lord of our hearts, have issued an invitation to each and every one of us, an invitation to come and dine. Will you come? Will you dine with him? Sir Leonard Wood once visited the King of France and the King was so pleased with him that he invited him back the next day for dinner. Sir Leonard went to the palace and the King, meeting him in one of the halls, said, Why, Sir Leonard, I did not expect to see you. How is it that you are here? Sir Leonard said, Did not your majesty invite me to dine with you? He, he, he was astonished. Yes, replied the king, but you did not answer my invitation. Now I want you to listen to this. Listen to his response. Then it was then that Sir Leonard Wood uttered one of the choicest sentences of his life. He replied, a king's invitation is not to be answered, but to be obeyed. It's like the parable of the two sons that Jesus told us about. He said the father invited or he asked his two sons to go and work in the field today. They both answered, but only one obeyed. The king of glory is calling. The king of glory is inviting you to come and to dine with him as a part of his family. What will you do? Will you answer? Will you obey? There's a difference whether you answer because you can answer negatively or you can answer positively. But will you obey? The short the, the, the time is short and the time is near for Jesus to come back. 
His return is nigh at hand. Today is the day of salvation. Will you accept Jesus? Will you accept his inv invitation to come and dine? Will you come? Oh, sinner, come home is the words of that hymn. All you have to do is to ask. All you have to do is to come. All you have to do is to obey. Jesus is waiting to hear from you. He has sent his RSVPs to you. Obey before it's too late. If you would like to obey, if, you're, if you would, would like to receive Jesus as your own personal savior, why don't you pray this prayer with me? Mean it in your heart. If you want to come and dine with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, if you want to live forever, pray this prayer with me. The invitation goes out to you today. It's your Christmas invitation. Heavenly Father, thank you for your invitation. I accept your invitation and in obedience I come. I cast down every idol in my life. I cast down every stronghold in my life. And I accept your free gift of salvation. I accept the blood that cleanses me. I receive you now, Lord Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. I accept and I obey. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you met it from your heart, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now what I want you to do is to follow that map. It's found in the scriptures. Buy yourself a Bible. Read that Bible and be obedient to that, to what Jesus has said. Find yourself a church, a Bible-believing church, not one of those progressive churches that believe you can live any way you want and do whatever you want and love whoever you want. You, there's a right way, there's a wrong way. Jesus shows us the right way. Read the scriptures. Be diligent in seeking him. And if you be diligent in seeking, the Lord will let you find him. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. Merry, Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas and the Lord's blessings upon you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.